Hello, welcome back to Learning Happy Hour. Today, we're going to once again do two of our favorite things. We're going to have some fun, and we're going to have a very informative deep dive session. So, Mitch, what are we going to talk about today? So, today, we're going to focus on two things related to troubleshooting that a lot of people want to know more about. And that first thing is flow logic. What the firewall does is it receives traffic, thinks about that traffic, processes that traffic, and then sends it on its way. And then we're going to do a packet diagnostic capture to analyze the, that exact same process on a packet per packet basis. And this can be really illuminating for us to understand why the firewall is doing what it's doing when things are working as you expect, or more importantly, when things aren't working as you expect. That's great. So what we're really going to be doing is we're going to be kind of following the packet through the firewall, kind of like magic school bus, right? We're going to kind of see what happens inside and we're going to take a trip just like you're on a trip right now. Where are you broadcasting from? Well, I am on assignment this week in Bengaluru, India or Bangalore, if we use the old name. And it's one of my favorite cities in the entire world. It's uh, well, I got some footage we'll show you. So I think you guys are going to like it. I'm looking forward to that. This is going to be a great episode. Let's do it. All right. yeah. <laughs> Magic school bus. <laughs> I've never seen it, so I can't even relate. Oh, it's the magic, you don't know the magic school bus? I don't know the magic, no. They go on school trips and the, the, the school bus shrinks and like goes inside the human body and like travels around through the nose and the heart and different parts of the body. So that's like what you're going to be doing with this flow logic thing, right? You're going to be yeah. locking us through what happens inside the firewall. Yeah, we're going to Everybody- shrink down to miniature size, like the movie Inner Space, you know, 1980s awesomeness. <laughs> yes, exactly. Just like Inner Space. <laughs> All right. Well, well, what's the first thing we're going to talk about then? What did, um, let's get started with this. So here's what we're going to talk about today, Jason. And the main point is to understand how traffic flows through the firewall, but more importantly, what to do when the traffic does not flow like you expect. So, and that's an important point. I don't jump in and mention that the reason why people want to pay attention to this and what they'll get out of this conversation is they'll have a better understanding of how the firewall works for the sake of troubleshooting and also for you know understanding how the rules actually process the traffic. Because if you've ever tried to troubleshoot the network, you know how important the OSI model is. Well, these things that you're going to be looking at here, those are just as important when it comes to understanding how traffic flows through the firewall and troubleshooting that. Yeah, that's a great analogy. I mean, the flow logic is like an OSI model reference that you can use to kind of understand how how things work. That's great. So for this discussion, we're going to be pulling information from three documentation sources. The first one is a document we call Day in the Life of a Packet. You can look for it on Google or our live community site or down in the show description. I'll have a link to it. It's always known or also known as Document 1628. And it's a very illuminating document that shows you how in great detail, uh, the firewall processes traffic at each stage. Also, I like to call it the DILP. The d- <laughs> the D-I-L-P. I was not ready for that. Yes, it's, yeah, it's the day in the life of that. <laughs> also, we're going to be pulling from the EDU 330 course, which is a three-day troubleshooting course. And, and Jason, you have an affinity for this course. What is it? I love this course. Um, One of the great things about this course is it's three days of troubleshooting. So, and really what we're going to be doing here is giving folks a great primer where we kind of expand on that in this course. So if you like what we're going to be talking about today and you want to learn more about the tools, utilities, and specific uh, kind of troubleshooting uh, cases, uh, this course is is a great course. And it's also great because you can reference back to it later on. So a lot of great stuff in this class. Yeah, one thing, if I may plug on that, the, the courseware developer for the 330 course, he, he spent so much time with our engineers and our tech folks, and he's built a student guide that's literally that thick, and it's an amazing shelf reference that goes into so much detail. I, even though I'd been at Palo Alto Networks for, for several years, I learned so much when I took that course for the first time. It's, it's a fantastic course. Agreed. 
In addition to these two documents, we're going to be pulling from our support guide, the knowledgebase.paloaltonetworks.com, and we're going to be focusing specifically on one of the diagnostic captures that we call a flow basic. Again, link down in the description. So at a high level, I want to introduce you to the various processing stages in the Palo Alto Network's firewall. The first is your ingress stage, where you go through packet processing, defragmentation, and any kind of VPN termination or decapsulation. Next, we're going to get into the session setup phase, which is often referred to as slow path. And when we get into the, the actual captures, you'll see that term slow path used. And this is where the firewall does you know, forwarding lookups and determines destination uh, zones and employs some flood thresholds for like SIM floods, UDP floods, things like that. So session setup is a very important step. After that, we get into what we call fast path or the security processing step. And you'll see us refer to this as either fast path or the inspection and enforcement stage. And this is really where the rubber meets the road for most types of traffic. This is the, the rest of the session. And then we get into the egress phase where we do any kind of QoS egress shaping, refragmentation if we're going to drop the traffic onto a link with a lower MTU. And if this is going to go across a VPN tunnel, IPsec or SSL, we re-encapsulate or encapsulate for the first time and then send it on its way. And then one thing we won't be talking about in great detail here is a concept called session offload, sometimes referred to as hardware offload. And this is where the firewall can take certain kinds of traffic that's not subject to application shift or we can't inspect inside for various types of threats and we'll send it off through the network processor inside of your data plane as a kind of a cut through fast processing. Uh, it's important to understand that that is a, a feature within the firewall. So when you do some of these diagnostic captures, you may want to turn that feature off so that the traffic goes through the full series of processes for the entire session. But that would only be temporary because that session offload is an important performance en enhancement, right? It's an efficiency feature. And this is also only for our hardware versions of the firewall. Yes, something we would only muss around with during a troubleshooting exercise. Excellent If point. required, only if it's necessary. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so before we get into the actual nitty gritty, I wanna give you an analogy for the slide I'm gonna show you in a second. And so since I'm in Bangalore, I, this is very near and dear and relevant recent to me. Uh, this analogy is about international travel. So let's say you wanna to come to India, like I'm here now. Uh, you need to first check and see if you have any travel plans. And if you do not have any travel plans, well, that's when you would go through the travel setup process with your travel agent or your favorite website. And we would figure out what your departure airport is. Uh, they would ask, you know, are you on a no-fly list or are you somehow unable to travel? And then they would check the route that you would take and you would pick, you know, how many connections I want, how long my layover is. And then you've got your arrival airport, your destination. And then the, the airline needs to validate that you're capable of going to that destination. So they would validate that your passport is valid, that you do or do not have a visa, depending on where you're going. And then once you've gone through all that initial processing stuff, then they can issue your boarding pass, and then you can head off to the airport. So now that your travel plans exist, we're going to go through the pre-flight processing at the airport. And the first thing we all encounter is inspection, right? So they're going to check to make sure you have a boarding pass. Otherwise, bye-bye, birdie. And then they're going to do a body scan or metal detector check to make sure you don't have any dangerous items on you. Now, as a part of that scan, they're going to see if there are any risks were found. And uh, we're going to see what happens in either case. So let's say a risk was found. They'll check to see if they can remove that risk. And if they can remove that risk, you go back through scan to make sure there aren't any other risks they didn't catch. If there are no risks, or if they cannot remove that, we get to the enforcement stage, where a TSA agent, and this is a, TSA is the Transportation Security Administration that uh, we use in the United States, but almost every country has their own flavor of uh, their, their customs and enforcement and whatnot, border patrol stuff. Uh, and those folks, or possibly law enforcement, would take action based on the results of the scan, the inspection stage, and the action may be let you go on and take your trip, or the action may be uh, something more severe. So obviously, uh, you made it all the way to India. So this is a, 
you went through this flow without any problem whatsoever. I did, yes. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not on any no-fly list. I don't travel with risks. So yeah, I got here just fine. So let's talk about how this traffic goes through a Palo Alto Networks firewall. Traffic comes in, firewall does what we call a flow key lookup. And this is a hash taken of the uh, source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, ingress interface. And that information is all hashed together and compared to what we call a flow lookup table. And if that hash is not found in the flow lookup table, the firewall says, ah, this must be the first packet of a brand new session. And so we'll send that traffic through the session setup process. So we don't have a flow lookup. We'll go then and infer what the source zone is based on the association it has to the ingress interface. And then we imply, or sorry, apply any zone protection profile thresholds for floods or reconnaissance or denial of service protection uh, thresholds for floods and session exhaustion. After that, we do our forwarding lookup. This may be a routing decision if the traffic's coming in on layer three interfaces, or if it's coming in through a layer two or a V wire interface, we do a lookup on those tables and then decide where this traffic will egress from, AKA egress interface, which must be associated with an egress zone. Now, one last thing I wanna mention in the forwarding lookup step, this is where we can also do a check for any policy-based forwarding rules where you can take action and override the default forwarding logic by the virtual router or, or the other types of forwarding logic mechanisms. Great. In the destination zone, we'll also do a check to see if this traffic will be network address translated at all. And this will affect how traffic will later be compared to the security policy. And maybe you've heard the term as you've been prepping for your PCNSE test, the, the statement post NAT destination zone, pre NAT everything else. This is kind of where that begins to, to matter. The firewall says, what's the true destination zone of this traffic after it will be NATed? And that destination zone is what we would put into our security policy rules, but every other security policy aspect would match on the pre NAT values uh, of that traffic. And the reason for this, I think, is, and, and this is one of the things I like to point out to students is, um, is because we're checking this because of the very next step, we need to know what that destination zone is because we're going to do a security policy check. And I think this is really interesting, Mitch, that we're doing this, but we haven't done actually any application labeling or inspection. So what's the deal with this policy check during session setup? That's a good question. So just like we have the zone and DOS protections uh, very early on in the session to prevent floods and stuff like that, I call this pre-session enforcement. Uh, this security policy check that you see here is done to make sure that the traffic is on an authorized destination port or that it's not coming from a uh, blocked source IP or going to a blocked destination IP. This is what we call a five tuple check. Things like protocol, source IP, uh, destination IP, source port, destination port. We check those five things at this very early stage. Uh, and this is an efficiency process so that we don't go down into the inspection and enforcement stage and burden the firewall looking at things that we could have easily thrown away on the very first packet of a session. All right, so that I've got a great example of this then because when we go to uh, create policy rules that block traffic based on IP addresses, particularly if we want to use the built-in Palo Alto Networks malicious IPs, or we're going to create our own external dynamic list, we're feeding the firewall this list of bad IPs, this is where that deny rule would actually uh, be enforced because we are doing it against a list of known IP addresses. We've already done the intelligence, right? We already know that this, these are bad sources. Let's block this traffic and um, from, for an efficiency purpose or an efficiency perspective, we wanna block it as early as possible as soon as we have that information. We don't need to do application inspection because we know it's coming from a bad IP. Is that uh, a good place to, talk, to, to mention that here? Yeah, absolutely right. And one symptom that, that you can use to know when traffic is denied in session setup versus down in the inspection enforcement stage is if you look in your traffic log, the application column, your application labels, if it ever says not applicable, that's your indicator that this session was killed during session setup for a various number of reasons, as we said, destination port, source port, or sorry, source IP, destination IP, that would be 
uh, denied in your security policy. And I really like the fact that you brought up the, the malicious IPs, the high risk IPs, and then even the bulletproof IPs. These are ones that uh, we encourage everyone to consider adding to your block list. And the difference between them, the known malicious, we as Palo Networks are confident these are bad IPs. The high risk ones, however, we have been told they're bad by other members of the Cyber Threat Alliance, which we are a member of. And then the bulletproof IPs, these are ones that are often used by malicious actors because their ISP has said, we won't block you no matter what you do. So the risk is pretty high with the high risk and the bulletproof IPs. But I don't know why you would never block the known malicious. That's an easy button you can press. They are bad. We know they're bad. It's easy to block them. So why not do it? Perfect. All right. After we go through all of that, we assign a session ID, and then we move down to the inspection and enforcement process. This is- And that's, of course, assuming that it's passed, right? We, we didn't block it. If it passed the security policy check at this stage, then we know we're going to actually install a session. Yeah, great point. Because at any one of these steps, we could throw the traffic away, and it does not progress any further through the flow logic. Now, down in the inspection and enforcement stage, also known as fast path, you got your first inspection step where we'll do deep packet inspection. The signature match processor will identify what the application is and it will identify what any kind of content. Uh, and when we say content, we mean like threats or brute force attacks or things like that, maybe URLs that you do not want. And I have a fun analogy about the difference between these two processes. Uh, being in a foreign country right now, ask yourself, are you able to identify when you hear someone speaking to someone else in a different language, a language that is not your native language. And if it, even though it's not your native language, are you able to identify what the language is they're using? And to be honest, I, I'm getting pretty good at identifying when people are speaking in Tamil versus Hindi uh, and uh, you know, other ones like German, really? Spanish. Yeah, those are, those are pretty easy, even though yeah, I, I can, don't speak those languages. Yeah, I can tell the difference for, you know, between Spanish and French and maybe German, but uh, I wouldn't be able to do much more than that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of the, the word inflection. And uh, especially when I was in Chennai uh, earlier last year, it became very apparent when I was hearing Tamil versus Hindi. And being here ah. in Karnataka State, you know, it's kind of between, uh, you know, Chennai and, and other parts of the country, and you get a good mix here. So it's kind mm -hmm. of fun to, to be able to identify different languages while you're on, on travel. And, and so that's, that's like App ID, right? App yeah. ID is able to say the difference between, say, HTTP traffic and BitTorrent traffic, right? That's the idea. Is that, that's your analogy? Exactly right. Versus Content ID does require that you have some capabilities to understand the language being spoken. So when you listen in on a foreign language uh, and you're listening to, you know, each word that's being said and the context of the conversation, you know, picking up, you know, subtle inferences and whatnot, listening for threat speech, that is very analogous to content ID. And as you look at our data sheets, you'll see that app ID has one throughput and content or threat throughput is about half of that because it's much more intensive and, and uh, laborsome for the firewall to listen into that conversation versus just identify what the language is. It's like invoking a translator, right? Who's yes. listening. <laughs> right. That's a great That's good. point. I like, that. I like that analogy. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So after we do that inspection, there's one check that the firewall to do, will do to see if this traffic is either SSH or SSL encrypted. And if it is, it will do a check to see, do you have a decryption policy rule? And if you do have one of those rules and it matches this traffic, we will do decryption in the inspection and enforcement stage, and then we'll send the traffic back through inspection again, because as we all know, the difference between HTTP and HTTPS is the S, and that stands for SSL or secure. And when you take off that encryption, the S is gone, and the firewall needs to re-inspect it to see what was really inside. And so you'll see traffic go through its first path as SSL, and then you'll see another entry where it now says it's web browsing, for example, now that we can see what's inside. And then we have to inspect it for threats again. Then we get to the enforcement step. And this is going to be done based on the way you've written your security policy and any applied security profiles. And if the traffic is allowed by either the security policy and the security profiles, then it would be allowed to go out. 
If the traffic was denied by the security policy or denied by one of the security profiles, it would be dropped or take some other action based on the way you've configured the firewall. Perfect. So just to reiterate here, the security policy and the security profiles, that's the enforcement portion of the rule. So this would be if we had a file blocking profile that had a rule in it that said we're going to block executables. And that's what content ID detected was that there was an EXE in that traffic. Then we would have our enforcement stage, much like your your uh, analogy of going through the airport. If somebody had you know, something, uh, a large container with too much liquid in it or something else that was kind of suspicious. Um, it would be at this stage where they would be, you know, tackled and uh, yeah. removed from the premises. <laughs> or a missile launcher in your check bag. As I read on the news, somebody just did like earlier. This oh week. my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> like, missile launcher. I have to remember to leave mine at home. <laughs> yeah, <that's good. laughs> All right. So, Let's talk about doing a diagnostic capture. Now, before we talk about the actual capture steps, we need to first put out a PSA, public service announcement. What you're about to do is gonna be very intense for the firewall. So never do a packet diagnostic capture without first creating a capture filter. You can do this in the firewall CLI, or you can do it up here in the web UI, just on the monitor tab under packet capture create one of these capture filters as you see I'm doing here. And in my scenario, I've created four capture filters. Uh, the first one is from my DNS server out to the open internet, and you can see it's destination port 53, and the protocol is 17, which if you do a lookup is for UDP traffic. And then I've got a second filter for the inverse direction of traffic so I can capture the responses. And then just for completeness of the scenario, I've added two more filters that are using protocol six. This is TCP, but every other aspect is the same between one and two and three and four. Great. All right, so now just a quick reminder, what we're about to show you is a flow basic diagnostic capture and it comes from our knowledge base, the uh, URL you see on your screen, also link down in the show description. And you can follow this guide. Uh, it gives you every command and it gives you some great context for what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what you should expect to see as a result. This is a great article and I refer to it just about every time I'm doing a flow basic and when I'm demonstrating this. So this is a good one to when you're done with this video uh, in our time here, go check it out and spend a little bit of time looking through it and bookmarking it as part of your, your troubleshooting tools for the firewall. Exactly right. Troubleshooting, Thank troubleshooting resources, I should say. There you go, yeah, your guides. Sherpas, all that. Your Sherpas, yes. <laughs> so what I'm going to show you now is a quick demo. And the first thing I'm going to do is validate that my filters are in place and that my logging capture is turned off. Here you can see the command I issue. And right now you see my filters and there is no log feature turned on. Next, I'm going to set my log feature. And I want to show you the different options that are available to you. So we're going to focus on a flow capture, but there are many other capture types that can be done. Also, different levels of information can be shown. I'm going to focus on the basic. Now that I've set the flow logic or the flow feature to basic, I do a quick check to make sure that it is enabled. And you can see down there under features, basic is selected. So now we're going to go turn the logging feature on. I notice you got the filters up there listed as well, the uh, packet capture filters. Yes, I created them earlier in the web UI. Now my log feature is running. Now go generate your traffic and, and don't go spending a lot of time here because this is being pretty intensive for your firewall data plane CPU. And I'm just doing a quick check to make sure that I do have sessions matching that, that filter strings I'd created. And then I'll turn off the log capture. Now let's go investigate that capture. But first things first, uh, we may have a firewall with multiple data plane CPUs so we issue that command to aggregate the output data into a single unified document. Now you can then view that result, that document using less, uh, it's either gonna be mp-log or dp-log if you have a, a smaller firewall or a larger firewall. And you could go through the output in the CLI, but to be honest, I really struggle uh, interpreting the logic here. So I like to go out and analyze it inside of a uh, tool like uh, Notepad++. So let's look at that. You made it look really easy. I love Thank that. You. It's practice. Practice makes easy. All right. <laughs> so 
I've taken the output that I've, I've looked at in Notepad++ and I've pasted it in here for us to look at. And so here you can see the traffic arrives at the ingress stage. Now there's no tag value because this is the first time we've ever seen this traffic. Now tag's gonna become important later, so you'll see it repeated in the future, but it does communicate some good stuff to us. Right now, not much. As you see, it's shown up from my 10.0.0.3 address to the Google DNS server. And again, protocol 17 tells me this is UDP traffic. You can also see the source port and destination port, as well as the packet length, checksum, et cetera. And you can see the flow lookup key, which the firewall creates during the ingress stage based on this traffic. And again, this is a hash of source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, and the ingress zone. Next, you'll see that uh, we're, we're analyzing all of this in vSys1. If you have a firewall with multi vSys, that would be very important to know. And the firewall also says there's no flow key found matching this traffic. And so we have to send this through slow path. So we're going to enqueue it to create a session, AKA sending it through the session setup process. So that was the first phase of setting up the itinerary in your travel analogy or session setup where we did that initial policy check just based on the uh, quintuple, right? Just the essential pieces of information. Now we're moving into uh, creating the session and what follows next? So next is the session setup stage or slow path as you see here. Now- Oh, so I, got, I actually got that wrong because uh, that was just the ingress stage. This here is the session setup stage. Yes, exactly. Okay, All right. All right. So we receive our packet at session setup. Next, we just validate. This is the same packet from the same source to the same destination, same protocol. Uh, and we see that we're gonna do a policy-based forwarding lookup. Now there is no PDF rules in my firewall, right? So it says none, uh, or there is none, no results after this, this check. And if you did have a PDF rule, you would see information there about which rule this traffic matched and what the forwarding decision would be as a result of that rule. Since I have none, we move on to the next step where we ca uh, capture in for session setup, the ingress interface was ethernet one slash two, and the egress interface is gonna be ethernet one slash one. So this is like knowing my source airport and my destination airport. And then we do a lookup to see if this traffic would match any NAT rules we have. You know, like do I have to clear customs and things like this? And so it does match a NAT rule. You can see it's index zero, which is the first rule inside of my web UI. So web UI starts numbering at one, CLI starts numbering at zero. Also you can see index zero has a rule name of source NAT out, and you can see down below how we're gonna translate this packet from 10.0.0.3 as the source IP to 172.29.225 as the post NAT IP. Now one thing I should point out is, oh, you're gonna do it right now. You're gonna highlight yeah. the policy lookup. Okay, I'm a little ahead of you, I'm sorry. That's okay. Yes, yeah, so the next thing I want to point out is you've got this policy lookup. Now, it's not very clear, but this is a security policy check. And it says it matched rule index eight. Now, don't be confused by this numbering here. Again, we start against, uh, or we start numbering with zero. And so this actually in my web UI is rule number 10. So since we start numbering at zero, you would assume that this would be index nine. However, there's a disabled rule in my policy between 10 and one, and so disabled rules don't count in the CLI, hence it's rule number eight, okay? Next, we do this TCI inspect. Now, if you don't have a firewall running PanOS 9.0, you won't see this entry here, but this is tunnel content inspection. This is a, an alibi of the DNS security service that Jason introduced us to in a previous Learning Happy Hour episode, and here you can see we're doing that lookup right now. After that, we'll allocate a session ID, in this case, 55327, and then down at the bottom, we create the session and in queue to install. Essentially, that install means we're putting the session ID into the firewall session table, and now you'll be able to see this under show sessions all or uh, in the session browser of the web UI. Right, I was about ready to say that, that all of this detail, there's a lot of data here, and this, uh, there's an easier way to see some of this, and that's in the actual session uh, browser itself and in the CLI uh, session tool. But th what's nice about this is you're getting additional detail, not just summary session data. Um, and, and so I, I think the flow logs are really helpful in kind of looking at, 
you know, if you're troubleshooting, you know, a routing problem, for instance, this is one of those things that will kind of expose the why behind that. Or if you have a land attack, right, where you have uh, an address on the firewall with a NAT in front of that, so your source and destination addresses actually are the same. Um, you, the flow logs give you a lot of the why as to what's happening in more detail, but a lot of this is also in the session log, session browser. Yeah, great point. And, and to me, this reads like a book. There's a lot of stuff, you know, surrounding what I've highlighted that we won't necessarily always understand. Some of it may be reserved for our, our engineers or our tech folks, but the key points I'm trying to point out for us. And yeah, as I said, reads like a book. It really helps us understand what's happening at which point in processing. So next. <laughs> yes. Not exactly a book you'd read to your children though, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you wanted to go to bed, it would be perfect. Once go to bed time, or I'll read the yeah. flow logic output to you. The packet was received at the fast pass stage. So now we get to the inspection <laughs> and enforcement stage, as you'll see labeled as fast path. And you can see now we have our session ID 55327. And notice that tag up there at the top also says 55327. So you can correlate against the tag value as it came in, you know, from ingress, uh, it was zero. But then when we send it over to session setup, we saw that entry where the tag or the uh, session ID was created. And for the rest of the processing, that tag value will align with the session ID 55327. Then you can see some more information like the source IP going to the destination IP protocol number again, source port, destination port. But also we see here, this is uh, indicating this is IP version four as opposed to IP version six, or as my boss likes to point out, IP version five was real, just not really used. Um, and there's a couple other things I want to point out here, like type of service value or differentiated services code point. These two values are QoS related, and zero means that there isn't really any kind of header information for type of service or, or DS, uh, DSCP. And so the firewall is not going to really do any extra QoS on this traffic. But we could definitely add QoS markings with my security policy or use whatever values are defined here for my egress queuing if I want. And as you all know, I love QoS. Go back and watch episode three of Learning Happy Hour and you'll get a feel for how much I love QoS. Next, this is where we actually execute NAT. NAT is now being performed on this traffic. We did a lookup in session setup but we didn't do anything until we get into the inspection and enforcement or fast path stage. And this is where we rewrite the packet header now with the post NAT destination values. Then we now know our, our forwarding lookup. This is going to egress uh, out a different interface. It came in on interface 17. And in my case, it's layer three interfaces. So we're going to do our route lookup again. The lookup we did in session setup was just to determine the destination zone. But for every packet flowing through the firewall, we always do a route lookup in the fast path stage because you may have a route change as a result of a dynamic routing protocol or uh, ECMP equal cost multipath could cause uh, this packet to take a different route than the previous packet did. However, it's important to know that the destination zone must still be the same destination zone that was determined back in slow path. If the routing decision would send this traffic out a different zone, the session would die right now because it's not the same destination zone that was determined during slow path. And you just actually captured a troubleshooting scenario right? uh, where traffic is being dropped and there's some question as to why, and that could be exposed by identifying what the destination zone is. And um, this could be a potential way of determining that. Exactly right, yeah. And you can see, you know, the, the route information that was determined now in fast path stage, it was decided by virtual router run. And you can see, you know, the lookup was done. And then our, our egress interface is shown, the zone associated and my next hop. All right, next you can see we do our ARP, right? We resolve our next hop interface. We get our entry, whether this was a cached ARP entry or we, uh, we do it, you know, fresh for the first time. And then we move on to our egress stage. You can see our tag value is the same as the session ID, so we can correlate. Because if you've got a lot of traffic matching your capture filters, uh, they can be kind of meshed together, and you need to be able to know which uh, data from the output log matches the same packet. And so that tag value is kind of your little key to be able to follow it through. And you can also use like you know MAC addresses and, and packet sizes and stuff like that. 
uh, as well as date and timestamp, but still that tag value is gonna be your best friend. All right, so that's my session ID. Uh, then I've got my IP address uh, information, protocol number, version, all that type of service, and we can see our ports again, and now we transmit our packet out port 16. So that's the traffic going through a flow basic capture. And I think it's, it's pretty exciting to see, you know, all this stuff laid out for us because when we're trying to figure out what's happening, here it is. It tells us exactly what's happening. This is great, especially in a lab environment where you want to kind of follow packets from a testing uh, point of view and to learn more about the inner workings of that firewall and, you know, kind of like the magic school bus kind of scenario where you kind of work in your way through some sort of, you know, arterial system, system. Yeah. arterial system, the lungs, whatever it does. <laughs> if you aren't familiar with that, it's like a little children's show if, uh, um, back in the 80s or whatever. Uh, the point is you can, you can learn from uh, the flow uh, flow basic and the packet diagnostic logs. But again, just want to reiterate the importance if you do this on a production machine, it's usually want to do that with the guidance of support and be sure that you have a capture filter in place and be aware of the fact that this does have an impact on the performance of the firewall. Exactly right. Okay, so that's just a flow capture. Now there's several different types of captures you can do. Again, we focused on flow, but these are all other ones that I find very helpful. So a lot of different logs beyond just that flow basic log that you broke through, logs for a lot of other different troubleshooting cases. Exactly right. All right, folks, uh, we've, we've dove deep right now and I wanna kind of end on a refreshing note. I've been having a fantastic time here in India. And if you've never been to India or don't know much about it, I wanna introduce you to what I love about India, the food, the people, the culture, check it out. Bangalore Airport and this guy just found me. He is a learning happy hour fan. What's your name again? Anurag. Anurag, right. Yeah. And your buddy Russell? Yeah. Nice. So, hey, you guys are going to be on our episode now. That is Thanks. amazing. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Small world. Yeah, Go Pan OS. Oh, that's fantastic, Mitch. Thank you so much for sharing. I love India. And we want to thank you for watching and we want to hear from you. So please send us an email at learninghappyhour.paloaltonetworks.com and many of the things that we are doing and have on our schedule and planning on doing well those things come by request so if there's something you're interested in learning more about uh, by all means let us know thanks for watching cheers cheers Daddy, where do packets come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, this one came from Interface 17. <clears throat> yeah, but the bedtime conversations are just endless. Thank you for watching this episode of Learning Happy Hour. At Palo Alto Networks, we are strong advocates of continuous learning, and we hope you are too. 
To continue learning about our fantastic products and services, you can attend a class with one of our authorized training centers, or you can self-study about these products and services through our digital e-learning courses. And if you like this episode of Learning Happy Hour, consider watching this one or this one. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. And thanks again for watching.